Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Peter Davis. Uh, I'm chairing uh, this evening, uh, and um, the focus is obviously uh, on can democracy safeguard the future, a discussion built around the publication of a book um, of the same name uh, by Professor Graham Smith, uh, who's, uh, who's with us, uh, as I hope you can see. Uh, and Graham is chair of the Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable Development, uh, and I'm honored to be a trustee of that foundation uh, and delighted to be able to host uh, this session uh, alongside the Center for Understanding Sustainable uh, Prosperity. Um, we will have uh, an hour and a half uh, this evening um, to go through uh, First of all, Graham's uh, exploration of the theme of the book, uh, and then uh, I'll be joined uh, by the esteemed panel that you can uh, also probably uh, now see, and I'll introduce uh, individually uh, in, in, a, in a moment. Um, but first to go, go back uh, to, to Graham. Um, Graham, as I say, is uh, director of the, uh, oh, it's rather uh, chair of the Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable uh, Development, uh, and does uh, have a, a day job as well. Uh, as Professor of Politics and Director of the Centre for uh, the Study of Democracy at Westminster University. Um, he's also just told me that he's been appointed by the European Climate Foundation uh, to run the Knowledge Network uh, on uh, Climate uh, Assemblies, which is, uh, I'm sure, going to be relevant to the discussion that we're going to have. Um, so, along with Graham, I'm joined by a very esteemed uh, panel. Um, first of all, Jonathan, Jonathan Porritt. Um, most of you, I'm sure, will know Jonathan, and to quote from uh, Jonathan's website, uh, he says, I've been in the sustainability world for a very long time, having joined the Green Party in the summer of 1974, but I genuinely can't recall ever feeling the same intense combination of despair and hope. Uh, hence the title of his recent book, uh, Hope in Hell. And I had the pleasure of working with Jonathan as a member of the much missed uh, UK Sustainable Development uh, Commission, which he chaired for uh, a number of years. Um, we're also joined by Indra, uh, Indra Akram, uh, co-initiator of the Alternative UK Political uh, Platform. Um, running community collaboratories across the UK, uh, building citizen action uh, networks, a founder of the Soft Power uh, Network and writing consistently about soft power, public diplomacy and the power of attraction and relationship in international relationships. Um, and uh, with a book about to be published also, uh, and to flag that, The Politics of uh, Waking Up. And I'm sure we'll make uh, links available so that you can uh, find out more about that book. And I'm sure uh, Indra will refer to it as well as we go through. Uh, and then finally, um, and, and we did have a competition for who, the order here, and there was a competition to go last uh, between Indra and Natasha. So uh, Natasha won uh, that comp competition, and but delighted to uh, introduce Natasha Natasha Call, uh, Kashmiri novelist, writer, politic, uh, politics, uh, international relationships, academic, poet, traveler, dreamer, economist, and artist, as it says uh, on the website. Uh, and with such a range, uh, in, uh, Natasha often finds herself speaking uh, to and engaged with and writing and addressing uh, specific audiences who do not speak to each other very often. And I think that's, uh, hopefully, we have a bit of an audience tonight that don't speak uh, to each other very, uh, very often. No doubt we'll, we'll find that out or whether we're part of the uh, echo, echo chambers. Um, Natasha continues to write and speak on issues of political economy, neoliberalism, economic justice, and economic uh, violence. And, uh, <laughs> Her current work includes uh, a focus on contemporary global ascendant uh, in terms of the right-wing uh, pro projects. Now, as with all our panelists, her CV cannot be summarized in a few sentences. So I think what we'll do is we'll post uh, the links uh, up online so you can find out a little bit more about each of them and their really varied uh, pieces of work. So before we go back to the panelists, let's start with, uh, dare I call him the star of the show, uh, which is uh, obviously Graham, uh, delighted uh, that we're able to host this event to uh, launch uh, the new book, um, which provides the focus for uh, the evening. Um, Graham, first of all, congratulations. Um, and I think uh, I speak on behalf of many and congratulate you, congratulate you on a book, uh, which is both timely, but also succinct. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and also at a point where, where you say, 
the policy door is slightly ajar. So let's just uh, briefly explore the key themes of the book. Um, starting with the first of those themes, um, why is democracy poor at dealing with the long term? Um, well, <clears throat> thanks very much, Peter, and thank you, um, uh, everyone who's joined, and to the panelists who who, can, who are spending their time with us, and to CUSP and FDSD for organising this. So um, I think we can look across a range of issues, um, climate change, pandemics, um, health and social care, um, emerging technologies, and we, we've got lots of evidence that democracies aren't performing that well on those issues. And I, and I in the in the book I explore four reasons for that. Well, what I what has, has been referred to as democratic myopia. And they're the non-presence of future generations. And there's, lot, there's lots of work, particularly from um, feminist scholars, about how if people aren't present, then their interests aren't going to be taken to, into account. So the first, the first is that sort of lack of presence of those people are going to be affected most by long-term issues. Secondly is the short time span of electoral cycles, which generates a certain sort of electoral party dynamic in terms of, um, in terms of political decision making and also confidence amongst the electorate as to whether these long-term promises will ever be delivered. Thirdly, there's sort of resistance from incumbent in interests and anyone who's worked in the climate sphere will know the extent to which, you know, you know particular lobbies, the, 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 um, the fossil fuel lobby has managed to sort of block policy developments in those areas. And finally, I, I point to some of the dynamics of the contemporary capitalist system, particularly sort of short term investment cycles and the sort of speed of new cycles and, and, and consumption patterns. And I think together those sorts of four uh, drivers sort of explain why we're in the situation, help explain why we're in the situation we are at the moment. Oh, Peter, Sorry, you're, the, the famous, you're muted. I know, I'm on, I'm back on. Yeah, uh, yeah, classic. Um, you obviously go on to talk about the design of democratic institutions for the long term and uh, reform or the need for new spaces. And uh, obviously I speak from a background of having been uh, Commissioner for Sustainable Futures in Wales and having helped to develop the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, uh, which put in place you know, the first sort of formally uh, recognized, the legally established Commissioner for Future Generations uh, as part of a process to reform uh, the governance model to focus more on on the new term and uh, uh, on, on the long term, and, and you do include you know reference to that uh, in, in in the book for which we are very grateful here in Wales. It's always it's always great to get uh, your reference uh, to Wales in these sorts of publications. But obviously, we've had a lot of interest in that uh, in that model, and you, you do go on to explore uh, you know the various models that do exist. So. What are your sort of thoughts in terms of that uh, sense of designing those institutions? Is it about reform or is it about need for new spaces? Well, I, I think clearly there clearly there are potential to reform our established institutions, both you know parliaments and and constitutions. We've only we've only got to think about sort of the news recently about the the, the extent to which the constitutional court in Germany um, you know challenged the Bundestag about its climate commitments for young people and for future on the grounds of the interests of young people and future generations so clearly there are those opportunities to develop constitutions I think parliaments there are possible you know there are opportunities for reform there I, I actually I think I say somewhere in the book that you know if you wanted to design an institution that is going to be exceptionally short term you probably design a parliament so we, we're sort of working from an institution which is actually deeply deeply problematic and those institutional reforms that have happened in places like Finland and Germany and others have really not bitten in the way that we the way that we hope so I'm I'm sort of interested in clearly I, I think we we need to do work in those spheres but I also think we need to be creative and start thinking about um, new institutional spaces and I think Wales is really a leader here in terms of the emergence of the idea of a commissioner, for, a commission for future generations. Um, it would be interesting to hear from you and Jonathan your thoughts about the, the previous commission that you mentioned, the uh, Sustainable Development Commission, which I think is interesting because that was a collective rather than in, rather than an individual. And I think that that I, I find the idea of an independent agency, particular for, for future future generations, particularly interesting. The examples we've had in Israel and. Um, and in uh, Hungary have suffered because uh, they started to work too well and the political class didn't like being constrained, so abolished them. So there's a really interesting tension there. 
And one of the things I explore, and I think the Welsh case is a potential example here, is, is the way that these sorts of new institutions might be able to embed their political legitimacy more by, by, by generating public support for the work that they do through, through forms of public participation. But I also in the book, and we maybe talk about this a bit, bit more, is I'm really interested in some of these new spaces for public engagement and public deliberation that are emerging. And I, and it, again, it, I focus on particularly the sort of emergence of citizens' assemblies. And there are particular reasons, which perhaps we could explore in a minute, as to why I think they're particularly pertinent. Um, what I want to say, though, I mean, I, I do make the point in the book, of, you know, I, I am focusing on these two, two types, these independent offices and um, the, the emergence of citizens' assemblies. In no way do I think they're the answer to everything. In no way do I think that they solve the problem. What I'm looking for is to, is to is these institutions that I'm seeing that are doing long-term thinking well, and to try and build some principles out of that. And I think, you know, and I'm sure the panelists will, will point out all sorts of other institutions that I could have looked at, but it's really the idea that we, we could be much more creative and much more imaginative in our institutional design in democracies to create those spaces for the long term. Mm. And, and it's interesting, I mentioned in, in the introduction, and you mentioned it in the introduction to the book about the, the policy window being slightly ajar. Uh, now and we, and we see that in terms of the Westminster uh, bill for future generations. Uh, I think the, the new uh, Scottish uh, Parliament will have uh, proposals coming through it, uh, at least from the manifesto from the SNP about a, a well-being of future generations bill of, a, of an equivalent uh, of an equivalent sort. So obviously there is a trend now to be thinking uh, towards uh, structuring governance more for the long term. Um, and it's interesting your, your reference back to the UK Sustainable Development Commission. Uh, the demise of the UK Sustainable Development Commission was the reason for the establishment of the Future Generations Commissioner in Wales, uh, because it was so easily uh, 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 abandoned uh, by the coalition uh, government uh, that uh, you know, the, the Labour Party manifesto uh, that followed it uh, in the Welsh, uh, Welsh elections uh, you know, put in place a requirement uh, a legislative requirement for an independent commissioner function that was there established under a legislative structure and so not at the whim of a of a, of a, of a minister so yeah there is definitely a connection between uh, between that uh, those those two but as i say the SEC is is a much missed uh, uk uh, commission function uh, I, I must admit so just before i go back to the back to the panel um Looking a bit more at those new institutions, and as I mentioned in the introduction, you, you've obviously got a particular uh, interest and indeed, dare I say, expertise around climate assemblies and uh, those sorts of functions. So just before I go back to the other panelists, let's just explore that a bit, a bit more. Yeah, I, th I think there's a, so, so for those in the audience who don't know, these are, these are sort of emerging bodies that uh, have, have a couple of really interesting characteristics. One is they're, they're, they're constituted by randomly selected citizens and the, the randomly selected members. And the aim is to try and capture the diversity of the population within that, within that assembly. And the second is that they spend time looking at a particular issues, that opportunity to deliberate and come, come to recommendations. And we've seen quite a few high profile examples emerging, probably the most high profile one in France. And although there are some concerns about the extent to which some of their recommendations have been watered down, the, the new climate bill that's going through the French Assembly is much stronger than it would have been without, without the existence of that uh, of, the, of, of the convention. And the Scottish have just had one recently, and I think it's been really interesting with the new, with the new um, government, particularly with the strength of the Green Party in, in Germany, in um, Scotland, the extent to which they'll pick that they'll pick up those recommendations and that that will be a driving force. So there are there are three reasons why I'm particularly interested in these new these new assemblies. The first is they're independent. So they're, they're, they are um, independent of electoral cycles. They're independent of um, of vested and in, incumbent interests. These are ordinary everyday everyday people who are being asked to think about these issues. So they don't have those normal sort of electoral party motivations. They aren't subject in the same way to vested interests in the same way that a legal jury isn't, if you like. The second is diversity. And I think diversity is really critical here. And I think, I think these assemblies are actually some, arguably the most diverse, in some of the most diverse institutions we've seen in democratic practice. But I think it's really important that when we're thinking about long-term, when we're thinking about futures, 
we don't just leave it to a, the political class to talk to think through what what these futures mean and I, th I think having a diversity of perspectives actually allows a diversity of insights into the different sort of social dynamics of futures the fact that some people will be more vulnerable in the future and that will resonate with some with, with across the diversity of the assembly so i think diversity is really critical for for good thinking about about the long term and, and future generations and thirdly and that combines with deliberation is, is actually providing that space for people to learn about the opinions of others like them you know pe people different from themselves from their from other people within their population but also to learn about the issues to be to, to be educated in those issues and actually to be in that position to make an informed judgment it's really difficult to defend short-term self-interest in deliberate in a deliberative process it's really hard to defend the i want this because it will be in, of my interest in the short term that's actually an incredibly thing difficult thing to do in in a in the process of public deliberation so because of their independence because of their diversity and because of their deliberation i really think these are really interesting spaces and really unusual spaces within a democracy. The big question now is the extent to which they can be linked and integrated into decision making processes such that their recommendations aren't just cherry picked by by political authorities. But you know I, I, we're in the uh, and I think we whenever you have a new institution it's too quick to kick to kick to kick them. I think you know we've only had a couple of years of, of climate assemblies. We only had 30 or 40 years of practice with these random selected bodies. And I just think it's just a really interesting development. And there are so few, I like Jonathan, you know, Jonathan's title of his book, there are so, so, so few things to be positive about in terms of sort of de democratic design. But something like this really, really, I think is exciting, re is really creative and is really imaginative. Graham, Graham, thanks for that. And I've, you've given a great sort of introduction to those sort of theme, themes in, in, in the book. Um, we're now going to turn to the panelists. And I should just say to, uh, everybody um, make sure you put your, your questions in the Q&A we'll come to those uh, for the sort of discussion after the panelists have had their three or four minutes uh, use the chat as well for any comments you want to make or links you want to put in uh, but we'll come back to the Q&A after we've uh, heard from each of the panelists and this is where Graham gets nervous because he has no idea as to whether they're going to say the book is good hopeless uh, or, or of no value whatsoever so uh, and um, I'm sure that won't be the I'm sure that won't be the case, but I know that the panelists will speak uh, will speak the truth because that's of their nature. So let me go to Jonathan uh, first. Um, as I say, Jonathan, we had a competition for who was going to go last, so um, that's why the order is, is of this nature. But uh, Jonathan, um, you've uh, as you say, you've been around a while. <laughs> 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 Indeed. Uh, but thank you, Graham, for writing the book. I think it's a really important contribution to many of the discussions going on at the moment. And it does really remind us of the improvements that are available to us in terms of strengthening our democracy to do a better job on many of these difficult issues than it's done in the past. And just quickly in passing, I want to support Graham very strongly in what he was saying about the um, citizens' assemblies um, and particularly if people haven't had a chance to look at this, the climate assembly that we had here in the UK, which of course was quite badly affected by the pandemic, was, wasn't able to have its last meeting together and wasn't able to do a lot of the press work, but the BBC covered the uh, citizens assembly, climate assembly really well, and they brought out a film which is just out now, and it is really worth a look because if you want to see what Graham means by independence, inclusivity and diversity and learning spaces, that film shows it to you in practice, not in theory, but in practice. And it's a great way of understanding exactly what the power of an independent assembly of that kind can be, which I think is a great strength. So for me, it's really important to look at all of these different issues. I think that the only thing I want to pitch in here at this stage, and I've no doubt we'll cover off many other issues um, in the q and is that this is not it's really it's such a difficult time to be standing up for all of these ideas because I think we have to acknowledge that democracy is under the most ferocious assault that I can ever imagine and it's going on everywhere I mean, it, it, it makes me uh, absolutely stagger to think about what's happening in America at the moment where democracy is under a ferocious assault 
from one of its own mainstream political parties. And the consequences of that battle being lost in the Republican Party could be a, a quite astonishing for the world. So for me, the question, can democracy uh, safeguard the future? It is only democracy that can safeguard the future. <laughs> And that is why we are not only now, in my opinion, charged with the responsibility of strengthening and improving our democracy so that it works better, functions um, more efficiently, but we're also charged now with the responsibility of saving our democracy. There are many, many battles going on to rescue democracy from a generation of politicians, frankly, who see the future very much in terms of undermining, if not completely tearing down democracy. And I do not exempt the UK government from this. There is a constant belittling of democracy in this country going on day in, day out, all the way through from a prime minister who thinks that the best thing he can possibly do is systematically to lie, not quite at the frequency of Donald Trump, but with the same degree of, of disregard for what democratic processes are all about, all the way through to a Home Secretary who behaves disgracefully at every conceivable turn, to the new policing bill, to new efforts to actually restrict the vote rather than expand the vote. I mean, honestly, you look at the story here in the UK and it's a nightmare. So as we get into our discussions, Peter, all I'd say is we do need to think about ways of strengthening, improving, enriching democracies, but simultaneously, we've got a bit of a job on our hands in terms of rescuing democracy. Thanks, Jonathan. You, yeah, you've uh, yeah, you've set the ball rolling well there in terms of discussion and Q and A opportunities. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, and I know that Indra, uh, you're probably going to do do the same as as well. So let's move move on to Indra uh, Adnan now, and uh, I'll post uh, Indra's uh, uh, con bi uh, bio and uh, further details in the chat as well, uh, because it's much longer than I was able to do in the introduction. So uh, uh, Indra, welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, like Jonathan, I'd like to thank Graham and congratulate him. It was a very useful book. Um, you gave me a lot of uh, information about the, the dilemma that you're facing from within government or from within, let's call it the establishment, to try to stretch further or to include more people and to lead to further participation. Um, but I'd perhaps just take you back to the point where we started the Alternative UK, which was in 2017. Um, and uh, I've been working until that time uh, on the progressive left within the think tank um, and trying to perhaps join in the, 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 um, the task of improving democracy. But at the point in 2017, um, where, or in fact in 2016, um, where uh, Trump had just been elected and we just experienced Brexit, like Jonathan, we were really experiencing the phenomenon of uh, the population being, you know, um, divided and, and in, in a sense being thrown into, uh, into, into chaos um, and, and feeling very much that no matter what the, the government or maybe the people, you know, the establishment might want to bring forward, you know, in a sense, whatever it was that we thought was an improvement of democracy, could still be sabotaged by all sorts of um, new tools, um, such as the use of social media or all sorts of uh, new narratives that are being uh, deliberately introduced into the public space that could just sabotage whatever it is that we, um, the people who are interested in climate change um, could organize for ourselves. So we thought, first of all, that our job really was to go to where the people are and when you think about the fact that only 2% of people are members of political parties um, and that the discourse really comes from this 2% and the mainstream news feeds upon this, part of that discourse is the powerlessness of people um, and the fact that, that, you know, in a sense, we don't really have a quality democracy. Um, people only get to vote every four years. There is no room really for the, you know, you know, what, what has been a growing sense of the agency of non-state actors, let's put it that way, has nowhere to go. You know, there's nowhere to capture it. And my sense is also that even with citizens assemblies, you know, we're still being very selective. It's still very much a top-down process. People in the establishment are still naming the questions, framing the issues. How do we go towards uh, really capturing the energy of people, 
outside of this 2%. And this is what we've been doing at the alternative very systematically, um, going to um, towns, cities, in some cases, regions, and trying to design containers for people's participation that really lies outside of the mainstream system to see what it is that they're motivated by, interested in, how they think about the future and capture that energy as part of a, of, a, of a new system of democracy. And I would like us to explore in some way um, what Vaclav Havel would have described as a dual power system, where you may have this you know, party political um, establishment that is, in a sense, naming the uh, mainstream narrative, but you also can recognize that there's something else going on outside of that, which needs to be brought together and have a chance to self-organize and show its own hand so that there can be a better partnership between society and government in the future. Thank, thank you very much, Indra. Uh, I've put a link to uh, the alternative uh, in, the, uh, in the chat box as well for people to find out a, a bit more. Uh, and certainly the point that you make there, the sort of link between the sort of participative engagement of communities, which we've seen you know, in, in so strongly through the COVID crisis, and that link between that and the dem democratic dimension. You know, I think that's that. You know, I chair the Wales Council for Voluntary Action, and and that, that's a, a constant issue about how we you know, we mobilise participative action at a local level. Uh, you know, which you see, uh, you know, which is so inspiring. But how does that feed into the 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 sort of, if you like, the top-down governance governance model? Because it often they you know people feel it doesn't. And it doesn't connect. So thank you, thank you for that. But more, more to uh, more to explore. Uh, so right, finally, um, Natasha has has her wish, uh, and she goes uh, she goes last. Uh, Natasha, um, um, what are your thoughts, having heard uh, the panelists and Graham? Yes, since Graham has been, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Okay. Yep. Since Graham's been very modest and not held up his book, I'll do that. <laughs> That's the book, and. Uh, uh, no, I really enjoyed reading this book, and I think it's very important. And uh, I want to really structure what I have to say into first reflecting on what I read in the book, and then some of the things that I think, uh, you know, many of the the many more books that Graham still has got to write. <laughs> so, um, so I think that um, I mean I think what's what's really appealing, and I think that's the hope to to you know to everybody else here who's maybe not read the book. What's really interesting is the idea of democratic myopia, like that is you you know, everyone can intuitively relate to the idea that we have these elections, we have these parliaments, they're meant to be representative and accountable, but they're only ever being buffeted by the interests, you know, immediate short term interests, and then who speaks for the future. So there is, you know, that that that's kind of I think that because what's implied in that is the idea of seeing democracy as a process, seeing democracy in time. And that also means that it's possible to counterfactually think of things as, you know, possibly being made better, even though, of course, we are surrounded by this terrible despair. Um, I think I really like the fact that that allows us to think about how the impacts on, you know, how the people who may have the voice are not the same people who may be impacted perhaps worst by the changes that you know that that may not that may be horrible and that may come so the, the the essentially the fact that we're not all citizens we're not all people we're different kinds of people we're different people who are interpolated in different ways into the social fabric and uh, and nonetheless i think that one of the uh, okay i'll come to the justice part in a bit but okay so the the this idea i think what it also means that we challenge is this idea that short termist thinking and fast thinking be equated with efficient thinking and that there's a lot of that there's this idea that you know here's a good leader here's a really you know great kind of party in power because they they giving giving us all of these clearances but you know and this is in multiple countries by the way but that's not you know that whole idea i mean I, I speak here as a heterodox economist for for a moment but this whole idea of looking at efficiency as this thing that somehow has a trade off with equity and that somehow you know without asking the question who is it efficient for is very problematic um, I, I, I would, you know, they, there's a spoiler that I want to give you, which is that Graham's not saying that the, in, the answer to can democracy safeguard the future is that authoritarians do better. He's, he's not saying that. Although surprisingly enough, there are a lot of people who do think that they're very seduced by this idea that systems that do not have democratic 
you know, processes built into them somehow can do better, benevolent kind of long-termism, which, uh, which, is, which is not the case. Um, so um, then, just very quickly, the idea of re whether legislations need to be reimagined. Grim talks about the parliamentary committees, giving the examples from the UK. You know, the Committee for the Future Generations. Um, I like the the really serious thought to institutional detail. I mean, it's a book that you can easily read, but that has a lot of information. And you know, and the sorts of problems. I think at every point, it's not. Grim, I did not see this book as saying, "Well, this is the answer." It's saying, "Well, this is one of the answers," and then actually there may be all of these five problems with this answer and we have to think of maybe 10 different ways in which we can address that if we want to make forward uh, you know make a move forward so some of the problems i think with the institutional detail you know is and and i uh, particularly was persuaded by these issues of you know how do we make things seem legitimate what about how do we deal with differences in social position the tensions between independence and di and diversity when we think of these bodies um, the the thing about the uh, you know climate change committees committees for future generations in different countries um, the evolution along the way of you know how you how how these committees get their powers because if they have too many as as Ray mentioned at the start uh, the stuff on feminist insights I like Ostrom's you know the idea of empowering uh, Eleanor Ostrom the economist the empowering of local committees as being important deliberative uh, mini publics etc. So all of that, I think, I mean, this is, I think this is a really important book and, uh, you know, and it's a book that cuts across a lot of themes. So people who are thinking about environment, who are thinking about democracy, who are thinking about, you know, justice, it kind of brings, it, it pulls threads through all of those things. And, and I think that's what makes it really, uh, you know, really a good book. Um, some of the future books that we must write, and, and I think more importantly, that we have to think about uh, today and going uh, forward as, as we have been. I mean, I think one question has to do with how do we, you know, so so uh, our democracy is basically putting a tag on who's failing to deal with the long term. I feel like we have to call call out the the people who are who are actively failing to deal with the long term. We have to name them and shame them and make it incumbent upon them. So I feel like. Um, because talking about democracy as as a system does not put the kind of you know pin individual people or entities or you know institutions so i feel like that that we need to call call people out more and say you're the one who's failing to deal with the long term and you and so on so there's there's that i i thought i think one of the other interesting things that that you know that reading this and generally what i think about is the idea of how can we harness technology in ways to make some of this deliberation more possible possible. So personally, as somebody, you know, who writes about democracy, political economy, justice and rise of the right wing in multiple countries, uh, and you know, the four democracies that are most interesting to me are UK, US, India and Bhutan, and they're all like very unique and different ones. But as so uh, when I interact with these different groups of people, I find that actually online is a very good resource. Uh, you know, it's it's a way of you can, you can actually find there. You know, there are rhizomatic ways in which you can link concerns with people who are also thinking about justice. So I feel like that's something that you know that we need to think more about. How do we make this online thing? And I know there's this whole problem of you know of misinformation. There's a problem of echo chambers, etc. But perhaps it's possible to think as as we go further of how can we make this work for better democratic futures. So that'll be my second second point. The third one that I, I was thinking of, and uh, you know, and the U U.S. has been horrible, as Jonathan said, and the U.K. and India, and and you know, one of the things that let let me give this example from the Indian context is that it's not that that the you know that the governments or whatever are myopic. They actually have very very long term visions, but very destructive long term visions that they want to entrench. So how do we deal with not the myopia, but actually the thinking of a future? but of a future that most people would not want if they cared for justice. So how do we deal with these particular kinds of, of right-wing formations that, that have futures that, that, you know, that they're very good with, with all the algorithmic manipulation, with populist passions, they're very good at actually getting those futures, but how do we, how do we undo those, those, um, those futures? And, and, um, and I think there's one other, oh yeah, the, the, the whole point about, um, no, two points. One, role of arts. This, this is something as, you know, because I feel like as narratives are really important. So can we think of ways in which the, you know, the, the, the arts, the cult, that, that sort of domain can, can make, can push this forward. And, and there are so many people doing that, but I just mean like more of these linkages in more places across 
different, you know, in, 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 in a planetary sense, because in one place, it may be a good government. I mean, it may be just in the art or whoever, it may be a good government thinking about it. In another place, the government may be awful and it actually may be the social movement, maybe the NGOs. So the arts could be one way in which um, this could be thought of. And, and finally, classrooms. I think that, you know, curriculum at school level is, I, I feel like when you actually think of it, some, some of those really big things actually come down to this thing of how are children thinking about the very basic things like when they're growing up. So are these sorts of things, can they be somehow, you know, the ideas about the future of thinking of the future, thinking of people who are not present, I, I, I mean, environment, climate change, yes, but even more generally, just this whole question of justice and, and for the planet. I mean, can, can that be like made to percolate, not percolate, but like organically be there right from school, <clears throat> school children level. So that, those would be some of the kind of points that, that I would want to make. Natasha, you, you've covered you've covered a lot you've covered a lot there, and I'm sure we'll come back to those points. That last point is is absolutely critical critical point, and I know we've seen a, a and Jonathan's highlighted it uh, the uh, sort of the, uh, the the youth movements which have been you know particularly effective. Having said that, you know disappointing we had votes of 16 in the in in the Welsh uh, Parliament elections, and uh, the majority of uh, of 16 to 18 year olds didn't register to vote. Uh, so it shows the scale of the task uh, uh, that you've, you've highlighted. Uh, you've highlighted there. Um, so let me just go back. I've got lots of questions coming in, but let me just go back now to Graham. Just sort of any sort of initial responses. You had a good. You had a good. Uh, uh, good positive response to the book from everybody, which is always uh, uh, which is always heartening, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure the sales will now rocket. But um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, thought, thoughts, just sort of initial thoughts before I go to the questions and and uh, participants. I assume I had assumed that FDSD had paid the panelists off beforehand, actually. For sales. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, so so one one thing I want to just say briefly and it has it has been mentioned is that is that um i guess and it was mentioned by natasha is is i'm trying to get i'm trying to get us to think in a different way about about institutions and, and the the couple of institutions i i focus on in the book i'm not in no way saying that they and again that was mentioned mentioned already in no way do i want to say that that's a blueprint for how we do things i'm just saying that, that these are really interesting political spaces from which from which from from definitely from which we could learn so when, it, when Indra is talking about creating, you know, kind of more sort of open spaces for community engagement, uh, you know, I think that's, you know, of course, let's look at that, look at the way that we can create those in, in ways that might might help us develop new futures. And I'm very interested in, in the way in which workplaces, particularly um, cooperatives, mutuals and social enterprises constitute themselves and, you know, about this yourself, Peter, in, in, in ways where they where they actually take the future much more seriously than um, many uh, th than the sort of uh, uh, typical companies that we see. Um, I take I take completely take the point and everybody picked up the point. You know how on earth do we deal with the sort of democratic um, deficit and democratic situation we have at, have at the moment and the sort of uh, the, all the tensions around that. Um, and, and it would be a bit like Jonathan's again, a bit like um, Jonathan's book about sort of like seeing positive things in the in the, in the moment of despair. Is that one of the, we are actually at this moment of seeing all of this really awful democratic practices or non democratic practices happening within democracies, seeing this real cre creativity, which I, I I think we need to celebrate as well. And so so I'm I'm very interested in sort of the fact that the the assemblies for all for all of their problems and, and other sorts of institutions that are emerging and various sorts of community practice show us that we can do democracy better at the very moment when democracy is under threat so but, but that is without not at all trying to get away from the kinds of the kinds of problems we face but I, it, one of the things that does um does cheer me is that is that certainly the political confidence that we're seeing in some of these new institutions from people compared to traditional institutions when when people learn about them, when they come across them, and Jonathan was talking about that film, the, the, the film, and that actually goes to something in a, in a response to Natasha. That was you know that was a documentary maker actually doing a film around around um, a, a climate assembly. Climate assemblies 
could, could be a bit of a dry topic, but really, de you know, really dealt with the, the sort of everyday experiences of a diverse group of participants, really brought it home to people about the fact that these are everyday people making really difficult decisions. So I do see that sort of that, that combination of sort of trying to think about how we think about sort of hard nosed questions about institutional design, but also how do we think about that linking with social movements? I'm very, have been very interested in and inspired by Extinction Rebellion and their creativity and the way that they use art and they use political messaging together as one and the same thing. And I think this is, that is, that is really exciting. Um, but there is a politics here. And, and I think one of the criticisms, which I kind of get the hint from the, the three, the three, um, the, the three the three panelists is that I don't say much about the politics of this in the sense of I, I, I talk about it in the politics and thinking about the design of political institutions but I say very little about okay how do we get from here to there and I think that's a reasonable criticism uh, I can make two excuses one is it's a short book and that was the and I was asking the question of can we design institutions better uh, but Natasha is right that there is there's got to be a you know, further work and work I, I do already about where where can we see the sort of movements for change? And I think that is a combination of, you know, thinking about how we draw alliances across social movements, across disciplines, across arts and humanities and, and hard sciences, how we start developing those relationships. But it's also about those sort of, those civil servants and politicians who do have, um, you know, even amongst all this hellish behavior, we, we really see people are trying to do creative and imaginative things and how we build that alliance and that's something we've struggled with with the foundation for democracy and sustainable development trying to build one of the problems i see is that too many people focusing on their specific issue and trying to build that alliance and trying to make a win on their particular issue how building those alliances of social justice uh, building those alliances of intergenerational justice are really extremely hard but they are the work that we've got to do if we want to see if you want to confront um, right-wing populism, if you want to confront those people who are engaged in sort of self-interested behaviour within the political realm. And, you know, that is hard, that is um, hard work, as, as, as all of the panellists know, and they're all engaged in that themselves. So, um, yeah, it, it, there, are, there are things missing in the book, I, I agree. Um, and, yeah, there's plenty of, plenty of extra work to be done. I, th I thought you were going to say it's the second book, uh, Graham, then. No, third uh, or fourth, probably. Third, I mean. third, third, yeah. <laughs> Right. Let me go. Um, let me go to some of the questions and uh, co and comments, and I'll bring the panelists uh, back in as 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 well. Um, uh, um, just one point that's just gone into the chat now from uh, from Graham Thompson. How do we get from here to there? How can the man or woman in the street participate as part of that change? And and that sort of a, a, a point that's sort of reflected in some of the other questions as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the uh, perhaps the, uh, the over optimistic uh, window of opportunity that Joan Wally highlighted, uh, the window of opportunity in respect of the private members bill, but what about the current direction of travel, uh, the inclusion of the electoral integrity bill announced in the Queen's uh, speech that Jonathan uh, ref, 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 referred referred to, um, and also Ian, um, Ian Christie. I'll try and bring some of these people in directly in a moment. But um, a tension between the new deliberative institutions and those based on elected representatives. How do we get a fruitful division of labour and collaboration between deliberative and representative uh, bod bodies? Uh, I always remember. Uh, a leader of one of the councils saying to me when we were talking about the well-being of future generations bill, I don't want another commissioner telling me what to do. It's my constituents that tell me uh, what to do. So, um, yeah, let's let's try and pick up some of those questions. Um, I, I, I think I'll leave it to the panel just to pick up themes that they they may want to sort of pick up for themselves rather than me di direct uh, that. But let me uh, let me go back to Indra. Um, on uh, any of the points that uh, Graham's raised or the points that we've seen in the chat and the questions. Yeah, sure. I mean, for, on, on the question of how do we get from here to there, you know, my, my sense is that, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, uh, too few people feel directly engaged with the political system at all. You know, it's not speaking their language, it doesn't echo their lives. Um, and, and where do they go, um, given that they are the greatest number um, that's available to us? It's the greatest resource, if you like, people power. Um, and what we've seen um, 
um, in, in pockets, but also in networks across the nation are increasing numbers of what we describe as citizens action networks. And we call them CANs for short. They take all kinds of forms. You know, you might have on the one hand transition towns, um, you know, which have been around for 15 years. On the other hand, you would have mutual aid networks which sprung up during COVID. But all of these are examples of people living in a place, it could be a neighborhood, it could be a town, it could be a city, where people are turning to each other actually, for some sort of um, uh, relationship making, which will give them more sense of security in this very turbulent times, but also it soon leads to decision making. Um, and I want to just um, respond to what Natasha was also talking about, technology will have a place in this. But we shouldn't go too fast with the technology because I think we want to avoid simple, you know, one person, one vote across the whole nation. You'll find that everything polarizes in exactly the same way as it has done on the internet so far. What we need to build is um, and create and constitution and constitute actually are these cans, these you know, containers for people to be able to have a vote that makes a difference in the place that they live, so that people can develop their agency. But this is quite, you know, early days for all of this architecture. But if you look across the world, it's happening at different speeds everywhere. You know, we were talking to a movement of um, of, of cans in South Africa only on uh, on Monday. There are move there are movements of cans in Portugal, in India, in uh, uh, in in Latin America. I mean, they are really springing up everywhere. And this is a phenomenon that I feel as ordinary citizens we should be paying attention to and give our energy there because there we'll actually begin to feel our agency whereas the current political system doesn't really give that to you or as chris has said in the chat are the majority of the public as myopic as the political system and does one mirror the other which um is is an interesting interesting sort of question does that is that does that uh, relate to your experience indra well no because i think if you're asking the 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 community the same questions that is being asked to the government then you might get that you will get disinterest but if you're bringing people along on their interests as um, Natasha was saying sometimes you'll bring them together through uh through through the arts you might bring them together to have a meal together and you allow their own interests to arise that's what i mean by engagement engage in the community eventually that will lead to how do you think how are you thinking about the future of your community um, and you'd be surprised, uh, we've, we've rarely come into a situation where people don't, you know, very easily want to see a safer and better future for the environment. But that isn't necessarily the main thing they're thinking about, but it comes as part of that. And they have no hesitation generally on wanting a better future for their children, for example. So uh, it comes along with all other qualities that they're uh, discussing. And also, give, when I say giving people agency, I'm talking about uh, economic agency within their own communities. You know, it's the waiting, you know, at the moment democracy only offers people the chance to protest or to vote once every four years. You know, this, this new um, deepening of democracy that is self-organized, that's really interesting. It brings up its own agendas, it brings up its own policy ideas, but it is definitely moving towards a healthier and better future for the place that you're living in. Thanks, uh, thanks, Indra. Um, Natasha, I'll come back to you in a second. But, uh, jo Jonathan, um, I remember you saying once, uh, this is, a, I'm sure, was a flippant remark, but I'll repeat it anyway. If only we could be China for a day. <laughs> yeah, the chapter in a book I wrote um, with uh, some irony, it has to be said. Um, yeah. I, th I, I, I'm sort of interested in this question about we get the myopic politicians that we deserve because a very large proportion of people are myopic and detached and indifferent. And we are so politically correct in the way we talk about this, that we have to almost put speech marks around the idea that very large numbers of people in this country, frankly, don't give a shit about what is going to happen through climate change in the future. We sort of feel bad when we say that, but that's the truth of it. And if you then extend that to people not valuing and cherishing our democracy, you dropped into our conversation, Peter, that the majority of 16 year olds chose not to get registered for the recent elections in Wales. Well, you have to say, what the bloody hell is wrong with them? Or what is wrong with the system that they don't see that 
privilege of being able to vote as something so precious that the first time you have it, you make sure you use it and you use it at every point from then on. And um, we've got so used to not really cherishing what it is that makes democracies strong, that we just let these things go by. And as we let them go by, we pay a heavy price, frankly, because we need to be much more out there in terms of advocating for participation in democracy. I know voting isn't the be all and end all of democracy, but let's face it, it's a pretty important part of it. And if you don't start with the bit that you've got, then we're in trouble. And that means we have to invest in democracy. And I was very struck by the, this question of um, local initiatives here, a bridge between all of these initiatives that sprang up during the pandemic, which have been extraordinarily inspirational and where we are now in addressing some of these issues around the fair or just transition and so on. You have to invest in this. I can't remember how many local authorities now have declared a climate emergency across the UK, but it's a large number. You'd have to go on and say, how many of them have actually then decided to invest in engaging with their local citizens to make sure that that emergency is turned into a set of practical responses at the local level. I was party to an interesting example in, in Ada, um, shore and by sea on the south coast. They ran a climate assembly for people in the Ada district, um, ran it really well, uh, did everything they should have done, completely inclusive and by sortition and all the rest of it. It was just admirable and it fed through into the local council and it's had a huge effect. But so many authorities just say, hey, guess what? I've ticked the box We're, we know this is an emergency. Now it's over to you. Well, solid, that's not good enough. And we need to understand that the price of protecting democracy is actual investment in it, time and money, time and money in making our democracies work. Thanks, Jonathan. I think that's a, 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 sort of one of the key takeaways. I think the cherishing of democracy uh, the, and, and what that means is, is a really important, uh, an important um, uh, theme that I think we need to continue to develop. Uh, Natasha, let me come back to you. I've got some more questions uh, which we need to pick up uh, after, afterwards. I'll just take your, your points in a minute, Natasha, but just sort of flagging uh, Kieran uh, Cummins from Demos. Um, which I'll come back to in a second, Kieran, uh, the link between the kind of democratic reform and innovation being discussed and the work of Hilary Cotton has done on design and running, running public welfare and public services more generally. How can they be more participatory? Uh, that's a, an interesting area to, to explore. Um, and uh, yes, and Caroline, you talk, asks about, again, this theme about exciting those people who want to participate in deliberative processes, they're usually not present in those spaces. Um, uh, disillusioned, often they have not, think they have nothing to offer, uh, don't identify with the issue being debated. Uh, yeah, really, you know, key key themes there. Natasha, do you want to just come in? <clears throat> uh, yeah. You don't have to answer those points, just come in on the, the ones you want to pick up. Just, just reflecting on some of the things that we've been talking about. So I think that, I mean, I think one of the things that, that I want to ask is whether, um, you know, whether people are not excited by engaged in and, you know, participating in all these things because, uh, you know, because they they don't know or whether this, I mean, is, is this like an unintended outcome or is this the way it's meant to be? I mean, I think that there's a lot invested in the system that is about keeping people so busy, so tired, so addicted to the sorts of things that they're already doing that they don't think about the things that that they're not meant to think about. So I feel like this is not a, uh, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't think that this is, I mean, this is, this is how it's meant to be essentially. So, uh, you know, to, to, to undo this or to, to try to undo this would mean going against that grain. And that's a pretty fundamental sort of, you know, thing. And that's why we've, we've struggled about it for so long with, with all of this for so long everywhere. So, so that's that's one thing. I mean, I think we have to think about how, and this is why I was thinking maybe, you know, like if, if there was chapters in schools about let's think about the future type thing, like you know, how how do we build this in? This is this is slow work. Um, and secondly, this idea of location. I mean, I have, um, you know, I feel that this 
that location, I mean, there is physical location and there's, it's important to be sort of embedded in a location, but uh, one of the location ideas of location that's at work here is, is the idea of a location in time. Because the very reason that people aren't thinking about the future is because they are, they're located here and in the now and in their now only. So part of the, the location, one's own kind of subjective location is also to be able to think about the reality of other people whether they be other people further away from us in space or further away from us in time. And I think that this is related, the, the inability to think about people further away in space and inability to think about further away in time is actually related. So this, and, and this is a, a part of where I think good media, like you know, critical media and, and including social media can do, is actually get people to think about well you know you're you're being apathetic but think about the fact that there are people who are who may be getting shot because they want to vote and they won't be able to vote you know it, just just encountering that reality may make people think differently about the sorts of things that you know that they don't give give mind to so i feel that that's really important to con to uh, uh, you know, what, what people have called global, this idea that we have to also be global at the same time in all of these, because some of these things also have like huge costs attached to them. I mean, it's, you know, mitigating climate change and those sorts of things. Uh, it, it's all connected also to, you know, to, to, uh, to places where livelihoods are, 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 are going to be impacted by this, to places where people won't be able to mitigate, uh, you know, and, and so, so I, so unless we're thinking about this within the kind of methodological nationalist containers of specific kind of countries as, as kind of self-contained, which we're not, I think, uh, if we're talking about environment, then it is important for us to also think of how do we make these sorts of questions more, you know, kind of more on the agenda everywhere. Um, one of the, you know, one thing I, that I can share is that, so I mentioned this country, this small country, Bhutan, that, uh, you know, mm. and there, uh, Graham knows about some of this work that, you know, so I work on conceptualizing it as a biodemocracy, talking about the link between the political and the ecological. And in some sense, I think even in that country, which is a developing country, uh, you know, by all accounts, even a, even a, a LDC uh, at, at the moment, that it's, so the constitution mandates a certain amount of, uh, you know, uh, uh, land to, to remain under forest cover in perpetuity. So those sorts of provisions and a very kind of key focus on environment, on, on the non-material aspects of well-being. So it, is, it isn't really that this can only be done in a specific kind of, kind of setting. I feel like that there need to be more conversations and learnings in, in different ways that, that somehow that it might, you know, um, that might spark this whole thing of how do we deal with this our future. I mean, I think at this point, that's, that's really all I want to say. Those three points. Yeah. Okay. Peter, thanks. Can, can, Peter can I just jump yeah, in there? Because I just want absolutely. to, I, I don't want to, I don't want to just bang on about um, citizens assemblies, but it's something I know, I know about. So it's kind of, so it's, it's useful to, it's useful to sort of locate it in a, in, in an actual practice. And it kind of responds to um, so several points that have been made. The first is, you know, Jonathan's sort of they don't give a shit or Chris's, you know, people are my people are myopic. And it reflects to what Natasha was just saying about the sort of power of consumerism. We know that when people who everyday, everyday people who have not been involved in politics at all get involved in citizens' assemblies, they they engage, they really engage with the issues, they're really interested. It's because that space provides them with the support and enables them to do that. So it's it we know that the the particular context within people within which people are find themselves structures the way they respond to political questions and politics per se so it's you know the vote is very different from the sort of invitation to be involved in a in a in a, in a citizens assembly that goes back to something caroline was saying about well these are just sort of self-selecting people well actually the, the great thing about climate assemblies these are randomly selected people people have never been involved before and Jonathan pointed earlier to the um, uh, to the, 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 the BBC documentary, and I really would recommend people go and have a look at People versus the Climate to get a sense of how every day these people are, who, who, who are willing to and come up with really interesting solutions and always come up with solutions that are more progressive than government is willing to take on. And just two other things, because they, they link, is there's a really nice example in Bolivia of the use of of use of randomly selected assemblies in school governance. And the reason they introduced them in Bolivia was because 
What do you normally learn in a school? You learn that the most popular person becomes the school, it runs the school government, basically. You, you learn from a very early age that you're not going to be, you're not going to have a chance because the most popular people will be elected. So it's a really bad way to learn about democracy, mostly, you know, through school elections. But they introduced this to show that everybody has the capacity to go, everybody has a capacity to engage. And that really gives people, kids at an early age a sense that, oh, I can be involved in politics in a way that they wouldn't normally. And finally, I just make the point that there's a really interesting movement in Japan called the Future Design Movement, which is using some of these mini publics and other things to really get people to say, not just say, what do you, imagine yourself in 50 years time, imagine what, you know, what, what kind of world would you like to see and work backwards from there to, 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 to what we can do now. And I think, so for me, this is about and I've used citizens' assemblies as an example, but it's just an example. And Indra has, showed, has talked about other examples. What kind of political space can we, spaces can we create that really allow people to engage their imaginations about politics, which really allow people to be creative, which which give them an, some autonomy, which they don't have in every day in their everyday lives to actually make a difference politically. And I think for me that is absolutely critical. And, and as Natasha said, we shouldn't be surprised given the current political context and the way that democracy is designed and practiced at the moment. For most people, they don't give a shit, but actually they can give a shit if you put them in the right, if you put them in, if not, that sounds very, <coughs> sounds very, very, very elitist, but if the environment within which people find themselves to engage politically really structures the way they engage. Yeah. And, and it was certainly, again, speaking personally, it was certainly an experience we had when we ran the Wales We Want exercise that, that helped to shape the well-being of a uh, future generations act yeah and that civil society voice if you like that that national voice about well what is it the Wales we want um that that sort of civil society movement is so important and i think it's it's something probably we need to keep you need to keep working out you need to keep fresh you need to keep focused focused on both at the local level and uh, and and the national level um, and, and the language point is interesting, and I remember it well. Uh, it, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act uh, was the Sustainable Development uh, Bill, was going to be the Sustainable Development Act. Uh, and uh, I remember going into the minister, uh, and he, he was saying, Mrs. Jones in Mercer is not going to understand what this is. Uh, why don't we call it about future generations? And of course, that's right. That's absolutely right. It does make it much more relevant and much more uh real because mrs jones in Murtha does care about her children and her grandchildren possibly her great grandchildren um so in in that sense that that is the long-term vision that we need to build uh on terms of the role of future gen future generations but the civil society point is 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 is, is, is a key is a key one um right free for all in terms of shout if you want to come in indra there's a specific point that was raised by uh laura uh, which was, if community action networks are so great, why is it all that we see is anti-wind turbine community banners rather than pro-wind turbine community banners? I don't know if you saw that in the... Uh, I, I, I didn't see it, and I think I just heard... I heard. Um, I think that if, if what um, you're referring to is what you get to read about in the mainstream news, that's fair enough. But I challenge that that is actually what's happening. You know, if I'm thinking about what Graham was calling for just now, I would say, Graham, that is the CANS movement that you were describing, where people are coming together to create spaces in the face of there not being any spaces for them to talk to each other, deliberate, create relationship between them. This is really key, right? So um, I agree completely with what Natasha is, uh, introduced and my, my book, The Politics of Waking Up, really refers to that over the last 20 years, we've been in a revolution, in fact. Um, since the birth of the internet, people have been slowly, bit by bit, waking up to their reality. And this is not simply by, uh, only by, um, uh, you know, getting access to all of the media and the information that never had access to before, but getting access to each other. Bit by bit, people have been waking up to the reality that their lives have been overly shaped and controlled by a growth economy that requires them to be on the hamster wheel um, and consuming uh, for the sake of growth alone. And, you know, as a psychotherapist myself, 
I've seen how masterful the advertising industry has been to sell products into our emotional needs. Yes, we are mere puppets in a sense, uh, and that's quite horrifying for people to realize, but we all know this waking up idea. Slowly, we are you know, like the frogs in the boiling water realizing that we might not have the strength anymore to jump out of the water before it actually kills us. But on the other hand, all over the world and all over this country, you know, if you were to, for example, read our daily alternative, we know we made it our, we made it our purpose to write a blog every single day to show these innovations are happening everywhere. You need to actually stop reading the mainstream news, which keeps telling you the bad news about how stupid people are and start reading the wider news or get in contact with your own local community better and understand that people are not uh, thoughtless, careless, myopic. They, they are anxious. They are, um, you know, they are, they are oppressed. They are very depressed in some cases, but there's a lot of opportunity for people now to wake up and people are beginning to move into relationship with each other to do that. You do have to cure yourself of the mainstream narrative that tells you, A, it's not possible, P, two people are stupid, and, you know, and three, there is no institution. These new institutions are being built from the ground up. Anybody who knows about community wealth building and so on will know this has been slowly building for over 10 years. I really recommend people get invested in it. Can I just jump in, Peter? To yeah, yeah jump endorse, in, absolutely. Just to endorse what Indra said there, because I think that's absolutely right. And it's very interesting. In the book, Graham, you, you do touch on incumbency. It's sort of in there. You, it's, uh, it's a really important part of what you said, but it's quite, if I can put it like this, almost understated, very, very elegantly put, that incumbency elements in all our democratic systems uh, constitute a huge barrier to the sort of um, revived democracy that we really need. And what Indra's just been saying in, in that comment is pretty much the same. There's no doubt that the media shapes perceptions, people's perceptions of things in a very deliberate way to ensure that people see the world in the way that suits them. And in particular, in a way that plays into this notion that you are what you consume essentially. And I totally agree with that. It's difficult for people to go on cold turkey from the mainstream media, given that the mainstream media have now seized hold of the whole social media space and manipulate and control it to degrees that we are becoming increasingly aware of. Just if I may, Peter, very quickly on the issue about why have communities not been more outspoken in their support for onshore wind farms. Um, this, is a, this is an interesting story. I noticed the question came from people who lived, have lived both in the Netherlands and in the UK. If we'd thrown Denmark into the mix there as well, you'd have a very different take on this. And the reason why an awful lot of communities in the UK don't like wind farms is on onshore wind farms is because they have been imposed on them. It's not that they've had any involvement and in they don't get any benefit from them. They're just there through the developers and they're earning the money for the developers, but in a way the community doesn't benefit. We have an inadequate take up of community energy schemes here in England in particular, slightly yeah. better in Wales, much better in Scotland. Scotland. And if only we'd seen all of our onshore wind with a community element built in from day one, I can assure you, we would not have this crazy nimbyism about the importance of onshore wind that we still have today. Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100% Jonathan, absolutely. Uh, Graham, um, I, this question from Kieran I, I mentioned earlier, I, I, know, I don't know enough about the work of Hilary Cotton that was mentioned here, but I do know about the issue of the design and running of public welfare and public, public services, uh, which is sort of a done to exercise as opposed to a done with process. Um, you know, we have a really good co-production uh, network in Wales and a focus on uh, co-production, but even so, you know, the default uh, is still, uh, you know, public service is something that's done to you, uh, rather than that you have an ownership of and, 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 and a role uh, with it with, with, within. And I suppose it is that sort of link between that participatory process and the democratic, um, you know, ultimately the voting system, but it is that sort of progression or relationship pathway between those those two, which is really important, I guess. I don't know enough about the specific point that Kieran's making, but I, I do know the general point. 
Yeah, I think I think there's a there's a tendency for those people who are interested in participatory democracy to get very excited about the particular institution, like a citizens' assembly or a particular um, a particular you know participatory budgeting or whatever it is, and and actually. Um, the place we need to be focusing most of our attention is is actually on well, not most of our attention. We need to be focusing as much attention is on is on public authorities and what does it mean? What 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 does it is it a does it even make sense to think about what it what a, what a participatory public authority can and would look like? And I think that's a really interesting interesting problem. And, and it actually may go back to what Jonathan was just talking about about incumbency is that. A lot of, and we've talked about this already, a lot of civil servants and politicians, their working, their working uh, assumption is I already know what to do. And, mm. I, and I think that kind of idea, there are some really interesting um, local authorities, um, Wigan is an example, Preston is mm. another, where, where because I, I, in England, I'm sure that in, there are others in Scotland and Wales as well, which, I, which we could name, where civil servants and, and politicians are beginning to actually recognise that they need to act differently now that's a really challenging thing because often the state is held up as the you know as the problematic actor but actually can you can you seriously engage in co-production and co-design in ways that actually enable autonomy for for communities i think you I, personally i i think you can but it doesn't it does require a different way of working and a different way of being from actors within that within the public sector within public authorities when very often the the incentives aren't there actually for them to do that that's actually you know that that's really unusual behavior and we should the, the challenge is to make that the usual behavior it's really unusual that we run a citizens assembly it's un really unusual to have a commissioner when that should actually a commissioner for future generations when that should be actually actually standard practice so so i think that the two things here that I, you know, the invest, the serious investment in civic and democratic infrastructure is necessary, and you know that, and but as part of that, serious investment in, in re, in in understanding how public authorities can work to support that, and not see it as something oh that goes over there the community and get on with what they're doing and we do we do our professional job, but actually understanding how how you can how you can build authorities which actually take participation as a core part of their work rather than this sort of add-on and ad hoc thing we do every so often yeah no, ab absolutely um we we uh, we have an annual well-being report uh, uh, in wales and there's uh, there's one particularly depressing uh, stat uh, that comes through it seems to be every year which is in response to the question how do you feel do you feel able to influence decisions in your local area and and that has continued to reduce year on year the numbers who said yes we do, uh, yeah. and that just highlights that that point. Can I, can I just offer something in here, even though it's really at the lowest and the smallest level? But um, I, I don't know, Graham, if you're aware of the flat pack democracy movement. Yeah. Yeah. So what what, what I love about the flat pack democracy movement is is is, is it's developing a, a model. You know, so there, it, you know, it's it 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 starts with for those who don't know. Uh, flat pack democracy is um, where um, you know people who are not members of political parties they stand as a group of independents on the basis on the agreement that if they get into office as a group uh, that they will uh, involve uh, that they'll sort of tear up the rule book if you like and 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 do a fully participatory form of running the council um, and it's quite revolutionary um, and so it started in Froome but now there's uh, about 30 flat pack councils that are committed to doing this. And, and what they're doing is, um, and what they've discovered is that it doesn't work if the independents simply stand up um, like often independents do on the basis of, I want to be in the council, but they have, they have to already have good community networks and some sort of relationship with the community itself. And ideally, if the community is constituted in some way as a community, then you have a real partnership between the council and the people, and this is something that you could actually see go uh, go all the way up. Um, you, you might say municipalism itself, you know, as it's been modelled in forty, you know, fearless cities around the world, um, is trying to develop this kind of partnership model as well. Some some more successful, some less successful, but there is there is this prototyping going on uh, everywhere. You don't read about municipalism, you know, in the mainstream press. But if you if you stand outside 
uh, of it at all, you'll see that it's it's burgeoning. Um, and this, you know, in, in a way, almost anything that we've been calling for, again, there's something that I write about because it's something I discovered, almost anything that I find myself calling for, if I look, I see it's already happening, that there is this kind of evolution happening and it is coming from the ground up. Um, and it's really for us, those of us that are in the establishment to give our focus and attention to that and help it to grow rather than to think it's upon us to keep you know, in, you know, inventing the new institutions. I'm, I'm going to just, uh, we have about a quarter of an hour before we finish, and I'm just going to sort of warn you all that what, one of the things I want just to come back to to finish is sort of given that we've got Graham's book, where do we go from, from here? Uh, and, and I'm particularly thinking of the foundation, to be honest. Yeah, I'm a trustee, Graham's chair, Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable De Development. Uh, yeah, this is, if you like, the core focus of the work. Uh, our discussion is the core focus of the work of the foundation. So in terms of you know, what actions we need to take, perhaps as a foundation, but where are the, where are the sort of uh, you know, key points of direction of travel that we need to sort of pursue, some of which we've touched on today, so it may be about a matter of reinforcing them. Uh, perhaps we could sort of make sure we cover those uh, at, uh, at the end. Uh, I do though want to address Felix, who, who uh, put in a question uh, a little while ago now uh, around the role of the monarchy in the future. Um, isn't the preservation of a parallel system of inherited power and privilege, uh, doesn't that defeat any effort for the participation of individuals in democracy? Um, uh, now, uh, the role of the monarchy, um, let's uh, um, yeah, just uh, throw that one in towards the end. Uh, thanks, Felix, for raising the question. Anybody want to chip in on uh, 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 an answer we, on, on that one? Or a thought? I'm sure there's not an answer. Well, first, first of all, I'll just, I'll just say one thing is there's a guy, there's a guy called Graham Smith who runs Republic, which is, um, which is the anti-monarchy organisation. And my, my mum, who's actually on this call, I think, I think the first time she saw that Graham Smith ran Republic, and my mum's, my mum's a monarchist, was quite appalled that her son had got involved in all of this stuff. <laughs> uh, that's but I, but I, I am a Republican, so there we go. <laughs> 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 I saw one interesting stat just just on that point um, because I think it's it's not an easy one to to overcome. You know, the story of the monarchy somehow has everyone in its trance, and um, you know, th there's a lot. Of, there is a love for the monarchy. It's, the, what, one of the stats that I saw was um, something like uh, eighty five percent. No, yeah, eight. No, sorry, got this wrong. Sixty seven percent of people that were interviewed in this particular um, uh, poll. Uh, said that they hated capitalism and that only 32% of people in that poll hated the monarchy. And so why not focus on the other thing? And don't worry too much <laughs> about, you know, if you can't generate a real hate for the monarchy, then don't give all your energy to it. Um, yeah, thank, thank, thanks, Indra. Nice, a nice line on that. And I just, um, just wanted to wrap up some of the points in the Q&As. Uh, Molly put in a, a, couple, of, a couple of points. Um, uh, and the, the, is, isn't the urgency of climate change a barrier to a more inclusive democratic approach, uh, i.e. We, we don't have the time? Uh, uh, is, 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 the, is the answer to that actually, you know, that the, 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 uh, the inclusive democratic approach is the only way to address the climate change issue? I, I don't know. Uh, Graeme, you, you highlighted in your book, didn't you, that there are a lot of people who say, no, actually, it's the autocratic approach that we need to take here uh, in order to solve these big problems. I mean, I mean, the, the, the um, practice of the actually existing authoritarian regime doesn't give us much hope. And the, the problem with the kind of thought that we're going to install these benevolent green, um, these benevolent green dictators seems to run against all of all the history we know about the abuse of the abuse of power. Um, I, the one thing I would respond to, though, is that is that the climate crisis and other crises that we're facing are not one offs. They're not something that we, we either solve or we, or, you know, we are going to be living with climate change um, for gen Well, we, we just we are going to be living with climate change full stop and that we have to build ways of living with climate change. And I think, you know, my own uh, my own belief in this is that inclusive democratic societies are actually going to be better at managing that change than than other forms of governance. So I don't think, you know, sustainability isn't something we achieve and it's done. It's something that is a constant process. 
And I think we need to develop the sort of responsive experimental societies that actually can live with those changes. And I think democracy for me is, yeah, democracy well practiced is, is for me the only game in town. Okay, folks, let me, let me, we've got sort of 10 minutes or so just to finish off. So uh, a couple of minutes each, and Graham, I'll end, I'll end with, I'll end with you, uh, but just a couple of minutes each, uh, uh, perhaps starting, uh, since Natasha, you went last at the beginning, perhaps we can start with you now, just a sort of final couple of minutes on sort of thoughts and particularly focused on, on actions you think are critical to take forward from this discussion. So, uh, thank you. This is really interesting. And, uh, you know, I think that um, I, in terms of what what is what is sort of not that hard to do, uh, some of the points to pick up would be uh, highlighting alternative media, linking up with you know producing more more um, more information uh, by way of news that people can access, which makes them believe that there is hope uh, because uh, because despair is all around. So I think it's it's important to consciously cultivate the sources of hope. Um, and 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 actually be be global about it. I mean, I think that far too often we're thinking only within. I mean, it's you know, there's there's the overview effect to an astronaut from space. I mean, we're we're really all on this little blue ball. So you know, if we if we perish, we all to a certain extent perish. So I feel like picking up good examples from lots of elsewheres is important. It's also a way of linking up with what's happening elsewhere. Secondly, I think arts. The, the role of you know storytelling. Uh, I don't know if you guys partner with schools, but why not go partner with schools if you don't already? I feel like you know talk to the really little kids and ask them about what they think about the future and you know and and um, yeah, just just working with with children. I feel like just just at the very beginning of of things because there's so many linkages that that can be made. If you're ever looking for a writer in residence, I'll offer myself to write a <laughs> novel for you. <laughs> No, more seriously, also social media groups, you know, I mean, these sorts of online deliberative publics uh, that, you know, that online ways of just getting people to speak to each other where they're, where they're, um, yeah, not, uh, not quite echo chambers, but maybe with more focused ideas. I mean, people can crowd, when you crowdsource things, you, you actually come up with, with lots of really innovative solutions. So, you know, that sort of something around that uh, in practical terms, I think overall, um, I would just, yeah, and, and just to underline at, at the last, just to underline, yes, democracy is literally the only thing that can safeguard the future. It has to be a planetary democracy. And also it's not, uh, you know, it's not just about the, there are these things are endogenous and interlinked so it, and complex. So it's not just about climate change or just about the environment because through that, there are links to livelihoods, to, you know, to kind of economic justice, to, uh, and exploitation, to, uh, um, to, to racial justice, to all sorts of things. So these things, and, and in, in more ways than one. So it's also about why people, more people don't participate, why people think of this as something that they're not able to take part in. I mean, there's that part. But then there's also the way in which these things are actually linked in terms of how firms operate, even green firms op may operate. So, uh, you know, so so just just to keep within the bracket, the fact that that yes, there's 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 this, but then this is actually a, a you know a, a connotation of a whole lot of other complex things. So it's it's really about survival and and uh, environmental questions are one very important part of that survival, but they're complexly interlinked with lots of other. Uh, questions that are about the you know long long futures and to emphasize the the distance people we can't think about are people away from us in in space but mm. also away from us in time and, and that's any us anywhere so yeah. I, you know, that that's really important Natasha thank you very much and thanks so much for your contributions that's been brilliant thank you so much uh Indra Yes. Um, well, I, I, you know, I, I think in a way I've been banging on quite a lot about um, what <laughs> what I think should happen next, and um, uh, and I would say more of that. You know, um, we're definitely going to be focusing very much on growing uh, what we call a new media system. So not simply having this uh, daily alternative that we now have, but we want to develop a system in in which the communities themselves can be feeding into. Um, um, uh, you know, a news forum 
where they can share their good news, their new ideas, but also their opportunities for, for example, social entrepreneurship or all sorts of new uh, initiatives that are coming from, from the ground up. And I think I, I would like to focus slightly on not only um, you know, civil society, but like, look, asking funders, you know, philanthropists, funders to really actively invest in this kind of fourth sector economy that can be, um, that, uh, that we see is now, you know, growing from, from, from the ground up. Uh, ironically, the, you know, the slogans that we've come to distrust maybe like um, take back control, for example, have proved to be actually somehow quite apposite. You know, I, I feel that the people, um, uh, you know, to avoid being further, you know, manipulated by social media or manipulated by, you know, the old um, invested growth economy system that we're trying to get away from, do need to take back control. Um, and that starts not only with um, getting in touch with each other and communities, but, you know, there's also a movement, one which has been developing and growing, you know, off of every single human being, if you like, taking back control of their own mind, you know, of their own sense of self-sovereignty. You know, there's, there's, there's many more movements than uh, the one that we understand to be a democratic movement, which is mostly to do with voting and participating. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an era, it's, it's an age, it's a civilization of people becoming more sovereign themselves. So I, I you know, I, I would just want to, you know, in the sense, give more attention to the stuff that is really going on, but also get immersed in it yourself. Too often in these sorts of conversations, I hear I hear us talking about the people as if they're somewhere uh, at arm's length from us, and you know it's for us to say what they think, and it's for us to say, well, you know, you change your mind when you really get involved, when when you're on the ground, immersed even in your own community, and ideally in multiple communities, you learn to trust people more. Thanks, thanks, Indira. Really good, and yeah, a clear agenda there that you've set out in in, in the hour and a half that we've had. So, yeah, absolutely excellent. Thanks for your contribution, Jonathan. Final two two minutes, and if you could keep it to two minutes, that would be brilliant. Sure. Um, <laughs> so, in terms of the foundation's agenda for the future, Peter, um, I you already do a lot of this, but the focus has to be on young people and what needs to happen to enable young people to play more of a role in all of these different initiatives that Graham has mapped out in the book. It is so important to weight the interventions you make towards young people today. And there is one fantastic upside to that. Most young people are much more intuitive in understanding the linkages between all of these things. They don't really get single issue environmentalism. They don't get single issue campaigning for human rights or social justice or democracy. For them, this is, whether you call it intersectionalism or not, it is all absolutely part of the same picture. A big test here, of course, will be the new policing bill, which is a horror story. So the kill the bill movement, which is a really important part of what's emerging. Question mark, how many environmentalists are going to understand that much of their freedom to bring their cause into the public domain will be constrained by the policing bill and will therefore respond accordingly? Question mark. Ask the RSPB and organizations like that who don't seem to have the first clue about the importance of democracy. Jonathan, thank you again, as always, uh, to the point and challenging. Uh, thanks a great, great contribution. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and Graham, um, Thank you for writing the book, because I know that that must have been a big effort in, in the midst of all of your you know, tasks that you have and chairing the foundation and your day job, as I say, uh, and, and it was and is a great read. So uh, and it sets things out in a very accessible uh, way that uh, you know, is engaging. So uh, thank you. Thank you for doing that uh, on behalf of all of us, and particularly on behalf of the foundation, because it sent our agenda out very, very clearly. Um, but final words to you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you and the, um, Indra and Jonathan and Natasha for, for taking the book so seriously and engaging in really interesting conversation. The one thing I've taken was that, and I, I think it was a critique from all of you, most explicitly from Natasha and Jonathan, is that I'm a bit too understated in my critique of incumbents, incumbency and I need to do a bit more, a bit more political work. Maybe, maybe that's one of the things I have to do with the foundation. Um, 
I think that uh, you know the, the clearly we need to do much more investment in civic infrastructure if we if we're to if we see democracy thrive. We've got to be much more creative. We've got to be much more imaginative, and we've got to be much more persuasive. And you know, I think the the sorts of things that we've been talking about today are unfortunately still at the margins, and we've got to find a way of bringing it um, firmly into the center of the political agenda. But um, as once again, I'd like to say thank you to everybody, and thank you to the uh, many thousands of people who are watching this. I'm sure. <laughs> Well, it will be when it goes up on uh, on on, you, on, you, on YouTube too. So, uh, Graham, thank you, thank you for that. Thanks again to the panelists. Um, thanks to the team at uh, the Centre for Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity, uh, Linda and and and, Kat, and Catherine for uh, helping and enabling this to to happen. Uh, thanks to all of you who have participated in it, and uh, I hope we can keep this uh, this conversation going and take forward some of the themes and the points and the actions. Uh, that we've highlighted through the conversation. So uh, have a, a lovely evening. Uh, it's still blowing uh, a gale out here, so uh, uh, but at least the electricity has stayed on. So um, <laughs> uh, have, have a lovely evening and thanks for your contributions.